It is my great privilege to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, President Shimon Peres. This is a man whose personal story is deeply interwoven with the story of the State of Israel. President Perez was born in Poland and came to Palestine at the age of 11. As a young man, Shimon Perez worked as a farmer and shepherd and was one of the founders of the Labor Zionist Youth Movement. This was the beginning of over a seven-decade political career in which he served in virtually every political office in Israel. At the age of 29, he became the Director General of the Ministry of Defense, the youngest ever in, his, in Israel's history. He served as Acting Prime Minister following the resignation of Prime Minister Rabin in 1977. He proposed the establishment of the National Unity Government after the 1984 elections and went on to serve two non-consecutive terms as Prime Minister. In 1992, Shimon Peres was appointed Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and in that capacity, he initiated and conducted the negotiations that led to the signing of the Oslo Accords. In 1994, he shared the Nobel Peace Prize with Yasser Arafat and Yitzhak Rabin for their efforts to create peace in the Middle East. Two years later, he founded the Perez Center for Peace, whose mission it is to promote lasting peace and advancement in the Middle East. In 2007, Mr. Perez was elected to serve as the ninth president of Israel, making it the first time in the nation's history that a former prime minister was also elected as president. In 2012, President Obama awarded Shimon Perez with the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his extraordinary contribution to world peace. If Israel were to have a Mount Rushmore, certainly he would be on it. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Shimon Peres. President Perez, on behalf of our community, we'll welcome you to our city, and we know you visit us many times, but every time you come, you inspire us and you really enlighten us. Tonight, we thought that uh, we'd like to get to know the personal Shimon Perez. Uh, we've heard you given, give many speeches on policy, on military matters, on the affairs of the world, and we've always admired you for those. You've been brave, and you've always stood very steadfast behind your beliefs. Um, tonight, we thought that we'll ask a little bit some more personal questions about the man, Shimon Perez. So I hope you don't mind, and, and I'll ask questions, and you tell me what you're comfortable with, and, and we'll go from there. <laughs> By the way, I want to tell you that um, the first time I met you was in October 2004, when you came to U UCLA, you received the UCLA Medal of Honor. And I was just mesmerized by you. Um, every word you said, almost vividly, is still in my mind. You mentioned uh, this author, Iranian uh, feminist author, who had just written a book, book called Reading Lolita in Tehran. I was fascinated. I said, how could a man in his position, with the busy schedule he has, the responsibilities on his shoulders, sits and reads a beautiful novel about a woman's experience through the Iranian revolution, and I was as impressed as I am today sitting next to you. So thank you for giving me the honor of having this conversation with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So you have always come across as not only handsome, debonair, and very, very cool, very cool under fire. 
What I would love to know is at what moment in your life were you most scared? Scared? Scared. Because you look like a very, very... Really? <laughs> That's amazing. You've been in war situations, you've been in military situations, in political situations. Well, uh, you have to fight and you have to take risks, but never to be defeated by yourselves. And I don't think I was ever scared. That's amazing. That's amazing. I think that's, uh, I guess, what we need. It's not amazing. I think, think it's natural. <laughs> and everybody can behave the same way. Unfortunately, there is a, a great fear in our time. And for the reason, people who are a little bit caused taking leadership. Mm -hmm. There is no reason. And uh, all my life I was an optimist. You have been an I, optimist. Yes, I thought all my life that uh, optimists and pessimists pass away the same way. So why live? That's a good call, you're absolutely right. <laughs> why live as a pessimist? Better love that, that. I love that. Bravo, bravo. was 65 years ago. Wow. So I remember the Angeles as well. I can remember his is 67 years old. Right. <laughs> and uh, actually we started here in Burbank, mm -hmm. the foundation of our robotic industry. Mm -hmm. There were 11 young men, pilots, or people who were uh, engineers. They joined him our army, and they laid the foundation of our Air Force. Wow. And after the Second World War, we brought from the United States a plane that were dismantled, and we brought them together at Berlin. That was the beginning wow. of our aer aeronautic industries, which became great success. Today it uh, employs over 60,000 people. It's one of the best. All that started in a very small shop. And in 1961, when the girl visited the United States, mm -hmm. I suggested they come with me to see the place in Burbank. He was amazed. He couldn't believe that in such a small place you can produce planes of a Burbank. And 11 boys who flew and fought for Israel. They were living in a villa of Jeanette McDonnell, if you know the name. Wow, wow, wow. And uh, they were a very special group. They, are they were headed by an engineer, a pilot by the name of Arshwina, who really was the co founder of the aeronautic industry. So I used to come in every time to see how do we how are we doing. And then I met also the Jewish community mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. It was always very warm. Thank very you. Devoted. We hope we still and are today. To see yeah. you keep the tradition. Yes, we hope so. We hope we hope you, you feel the warmth. There's a lot of love in the room. You can definitely know that. That there's a great admiration and love for you. I'm going to take you back to your feelings again, if you don't mind. This is, this is Los Angeles. We talk about our feelings a lot. <laughs> Tell me, President Perez, what was the most emotionally moving moment of your life? Can you think of one or two moments? Yes, the one that may happen tomorrow. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. I'm looking for the great moving point of Israel in the future, in the next future, in the close future. And I think it will be calm by making peace of a world region. That's the moment that I, I wait for. Thank you. Well, we appreciate that. I, and, I, and I definitely second you in that. So you were born in Poland. And we are told now through human development that 
we are all very much a product and formed by our childhood experiences. What would you say about your childhood that has really formed the man that you are today? What do you remember from your experience in Poland, from your childhood, and who, what part of that still remains informed you? I was born in a small shadow that was basically Zionist. There were about 2,000 people, Jewish people living there. Half of them went over to Israel, including my family. Mm -hmm. And the other half was burned down alive by the Nazis, including my grandfather and his family. Oh, wow. So I went both sides. My educator was my grandfather, who really started to teach me how to read books. Mm. We were a nation of books, as we said. Now it's uh, Facebook, but then <laughs> it was... Oh, this is real books. books, real books. Real books, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's very profound and very moving. Thank you for sharing that with us. When we look at the world today, we think back at the generation that you were formed, and we think about leaders such as Churchill, Ben-Gurion, Roosevelt, of course yourself. This to me, and I think to most people in the room, these were statesmen. These are statesmen, as you are today. But in today's world, we really have politicians. In your mind, when you think about leadership, what is the difference between statesmen and politicians? And why does it feel to me, and I don't know how the members of the audience feel, why are we lacking the kind of statesmen that your generation represented? Well, uh, there were times where great leaders were needed. I'm not sure they still are being, uh, they are being needed to our society. And uh, I believe today scientists may be more important than leaders, for example, mm -hmm. because the world went over a change. For 10,000 years, all of us were living at the land. The land was the most important property. Nations and people have had to protect the land, to extend the land. For that reason, we have had to build armies or to wars. Most of the wars in history were really initiated because of land, defending it or extending it. But now we live in a different age. Our source of existence, existence is no longer land but science. And that's a totally different situation. Land you can conquer by armies. Science can be conquered by armies or by wars. They are not needed. When we have land, we have to divide it, have frontiers, have uh, to cultivate it. But when it comes to science, well, science doesn't have frontiers. Science cannot be commanded or order, it's really based on innovation of great minds, of uh, new ways. And the science has the request to war. So science can serve terror, which is very complicated. So it is a different way, different life. And actually today, the global economy is controlling the national economy. Governments are rather weak, 
both in economy and social affairs. They have budgets, but they don't have money. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones who really are running the economy are global companies. But global companies don't have a global government. Nobody can order them. Global companies cannot afford discrimination. The world became global. And uh, today, when you talk about democracy, for example, it's not to trust the right to be equal, but the equal right to be different. Different was legitimized in our generation. So when the political leader stands up and says, I am really very strong, people are looking at him, are you? Can you bring an end to terror? No. Can you bring an end to the social gap? No. So why do you think you're a great leader? Actually, you want to rule us. We are not looking for rulers. We are looking for facilitators. We are looking for people who are willing to help, to innovate, to change the world. And I think today leaders are not leading. Leaders should open opportunities to other people. And they should serve the people. So the concept of leadership was very much changed. Today a leader in my judgment should not be a ruler. He should be a servant. And I believe it's great to serve people rather than to rule them. And if people feel that you are their servant, they will trust you. But if you feel that the leaders are trying really to control you, they resent, and this is a problem. So there are no great leaders because I'm not sure they are needed. Today what the ones Churchill did, maybe a scientist from Los Angeles, He's doing better, God knows. Right. That's an amazing parallel, I think. That's a yes. wonderful way to put you know, it. Uh, and that's a, is that an optimistic shift? How would you feel? I, as an optimist, would you feel that this is, this is a trend going in the right direction for humanity, that science is playing such an important role versus politics? I think this is a personal choice. You have the opportunity to be optimistic. But unfortunately, we were put to live in doubts and in fear. You know, I think about uh, Sigmund Freud, who is really, from an intellectual point of view, a giant. Absolutely. But I don't like his lessons. He tries to tell me that I'm a complex, not a human being. <laughs> I don't feel like a complex. <laughs> I sleep on a bed, not on a sofa. <laughs> I, I think a uh, person, it's the right to be happy, to enjoy life. We are not sick people, we are healthy people. Occasionally we fall sick. So I believe that there is a reason to be optimistic. There is also a reason to be careful. Because science itself is neutral. An atom can enable you to be, build a bomb, or if you want an electric station for the science, science doesn't care. Human people should care about it. And for that reason, I think, in this world, while science gives us unbelievable opportunities, we must also keep the moral side of it. Technology without morality may become a danger. Absolutely. So you have to do both. Absolutely, I agree. As I was writing my questions, I was thinking about leaders, great leaders that you've worked with uh, in the, your tenure and your political life. And I was wondering if I could ask you to give me the first thought that comes to your mind when I mention their name. Just the first thing that pops into your mind, kind of talk about Freud. Um, and, and I really wanted you to, to give us an impression of very short answer in terms of what you think these people represented in terms of, especially these are all Israeli, Israeli leaders that I've chosen because I felt you had, you had most personal contact. Someone like David Ben-Gurion, when you hear his name, what comes to your mind first? Well, I think he's the greatest leader in the 20th century. 
personally was my educator, my yes. the man I was working with him, he took me when I was a very young man, I was only 24 years old. Yes. I wasn't uh, educated, I was a shepherd in a kibbutz. And the first thing that came, comes to my mind is having nothing is a great challenge. When Israel was created, we really didn't have anything. Mm. The land was a small piece of land. And in the north, there were swamps and mosquitoes. In the south, there was desert and storms. We couldn't have a real dialogue, neither with the land nor with the mosquitoes and the storms. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have water. We have had two lakes. One dead, the other dying. Yeah. <laughs> we have one river, very famous, the Jordan River. But it's a river that had fame without waters. So we didn't have neither land, no waters. You know, many Jewish people complained about Moses. Why did he lead the Israeli people to Israel instead than to Saudi Arabia? Yeah, <laughs> I made the wrong yeah. turn there. <laughs> when I look at it, I think he was right. <laughs> Imagine we would go back to Saudi Arabia. We would be like the Saudis. Mm -hmm. But facing the nothingness, the poverty. I remember the first day we didn't have enough food. But we were happy people. We had a great vision, a great belief. And it was great to sell. So Israel is a story not of a land that has enriched the people, but people that has enriched the land. Having it's nothing, like you discover you have something great. The power of scarcity, really. The human capital. Yeah, absolutely, and all right. Each, each of us, each of you, has hidden reserves of capacities, of talents. When you are not under pressure, you ignore it. It's true. But when you face danger, or want, or shortages, then you mobilize yourself. And that's the story of Israel. And just to tell you one story that you asked me to mention as an example. I was a member of a kibbutz. I was a shepherd. And Ben Gurion mobilized me to work with him at the headquarters of Dagana. It was before the establishment of the State of Israel. And uh, he sent a letter to my kibbutz. The kibbutz says, you have to go. And when I came in, I had a small paper in his jacket. And the first thing he showed me was, what is our defense situation, our security? Terrible. We didn't have waters, but we didn't have rifles to enough to defend ourselves. The nations that voted at the United Nations to recognize the state of Israel put an embargo upon us. So we didn't have a mean, in the means to defend ourselves. When I came to the headquarters, a young boy, nobody knew me, so asked what I'm supposed to do. Well, it wasn't a very great organization at the time. Nobody knew, neither me. <laughs> and so I asked the secretary of the headquarters, what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to say, he says, I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> but then, he was a friend of mine, and the evening he says, look, I couldn't find a desk for you, or a chair for you, but the chief of staff is sick. Why wouldn't you sit at his desk? Oh my God. So I went, I, Sounds like a movie. It is like a movie. <laughs> I went over, I said, this is desk, I opened the desk, and I found two letters without any address. So I opened one of them, and that shocked me to my bones. It was a letter written by a general that Ben Gurion suggested him to be the chief of staff. And that was his reply. Thank you very much for proposing me to be the chief of staff. I'm a serious man. So I went to see what is the situation. And they found out that there are only six million 
how to address for a flight emanation. At war, you need one million per day. Wow. So we have ammunition only for six days. I'm not ready to be a chief of staff for six days. <laughs> oh, no. Imagine my feelings. Wow. It was a lost case. Wow. But then And yet you weren't scared. But then I saw people <laughs> fighting courageously. I saw people working hard with all their heart, not complaining. That's why I say it's the people who are the natural resource, the human capital. That's the real story of Israel. I agree. I think you're absolutely right. Okay, Ben Gurion was a giant, so you gave a very giant answer. The next, we're going to go quickly because I would for ben quick. Ben was a giant, a person with an unbelievable memory. Really. He could have remembered the conversation that he conducted 30 years ago. Well, very well. Wow, I'm jealous. And he was an avid reader. Wow. And uh, he was a man of a very strong will. Okay. All his life he devoted to just one thing, the establishment of the Jewish state. And uh, after the war, he felt that we have to do it as quickly as possible. He went to visit the camps. He was accompanied by General Eisenhower at the time. We were not mad Eisenhower because Eisenhower took him to the camps to see the survival of the camps. They look like flying yeah. persons. And I don't told them, well, look at them. Because many people will forget it. You must remember it. Wow. And that's what my Ben Gurion said, that we have to establish a state right away because all nations, in spite of the Shoah, closed their doors yeah. for the survivors who needed a place to do it. Ben Gurion was fearless. He thought that the meaning of being a Jewish is to keep the moral core as a superior core of your life. Working with him for 20 years, day in and day out, I learned that he requests from you two things. A, never lie. If you lie, it may be your last day working with him. Wow. The second is always there. Don't hesitate. If you don't dare, he's not interested in you. Wow. You like only, taking risks. I, 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 he thought that daring is the right approach for life. Wow. And when I think about it, <coughs> retrospectively, I believe I remember our dreams at that time. And today when I look back, I think that our dreams were too small. Wow, really? The, the implementation of the dreams make the dream look small. That's Since true. then, I'm admiring our dreams. <laughs> I think you have to dream. But I'm worried that our dreams are too small. Wow. Always dream great. Thank you. That's and then you are children. That's right. Thank you, Thank you for that. All right, I'm going to... I want to tell you one story. Tell me. <laughs> Neither I can nor myself are well, great economists. <laughs> Both of us didn't have any interest in economy per se. Since I was the second in command in the Ministry of Defense, I would come to him and say, let's do this and that. So he put on the face of an economist and say, how much will it cost us? <laughs> I told him a million dollars. He says, a million dollars? Well, then are we going to get it? <laughs> okay. A few weeks later, I would come to him, come to him and say, ben let's do this and that. Ask me, how much will it cost? I told him fifty million dollars. <laughs> oh, he says that's nothing. <laughs> if he was for something, it is cheap. If he was against it, it, it's expensive. <laughs> that was a wonderful management style. <laughs> and that was the economy I learned in my life. At this holiday. <laughs> very, very effective management. I like that. Fun. Very effective management. Apart. 
do it in the, the blue battery, you know. <laughs> All right, we're going to move along to other leaders. I want to. I would love to hear your views on them. Golda Meir, you know, she was one of ours. She was an American originally, came from this country, very admired in America by the Jewish community. Tell us, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of her? They were powerful women. You know, in the cabinet, we used to call her the only man in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And, uh, I went to tell her her nickname. So she says, it's not such a big thing to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I love and, uh, that. And uh, Yom Kippur, she behaved like a lioness. Wow. She showed unbelievable strength, never give up, never lost her Fantastic. hopes. And she was a man, likely, for that reason. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, Menachem Begin. Different party. A uh, different party, a different man. Very different man. Well, uh, <laughs> You're no longer president, you're no longer I'm running for politics. We're among let friends. Me, let me first of all say the nice things about him. Please. <laughs> Let's go. And then the real stuff. So I should have a chance to say the other things. <laughs> the nice things about him, he made a peace with Egypt, which is a great historic achievement. He was also lucky because Sadat came to Jerusalem. We have had a partner. But he took the opportunity. And contrary to his ideology, he made necessary compromises, which I admire this very day. Secondly, I think uh, Begin respected the law very sincerely, very deeply. The other problems was that uh, his party hung too much on speeches and gestures. The party that I belong to was based on deeds and efforts. Daily small, constantly. And we thought that to build a nation, we don't do it by speeches, we do it by deeds. deeds. Mm. So we, I mean, I, I, I will try to be fair as I can. You're being very fair. But uh, there, there was a split. Mm -hmm. And the speeches paid too large a role in the leadership of this party. Mm -hmm. And the Israel was done by daily efforts, by small steps. Yeah. Day in and day out, small steps, but great vision. I agree, I agree. Um, it's like Rabin. Well, uh, it's like Rabin was both a commander and a statesman. And in the two domains, he excelled himself. He was a very admired chief of staff and very respected political figure. He also was straightforward, a man that spoke to the point and tried to look at facts as they are. And uh, he was worried not to raise our expectations too high and never to lose our spirit too low. We were friends. I mean, there was an agreement between us that if one will win, the other will serve as number two in the cabinet. So I so you won, then he won more. But we worked together. So we had many disagreements in the concept. He said once that, uh, told me that you are a builder of a force, I am a user of a force. Mm. Well, well uh, I don't think it's completely true. He was also a builder of a force, not just a user of a force. The fact is that he has had the courage 
and the two of us went against the public opinion in order to try and make peace under impossible situations. And uh, many of the people, like today, <coughs> think that you cannot achieve peace with the Arabs. That's one of the things that I disagree completely with many of the people. You know, in our 67 years of existence, we have had to go through seven wars, outgunned, outnumbered. Uh, if you judge it by reason, we didn't stand a, ch a chance to win the wars. We won the wars. But winning a war was not a triumph. It's a passing situation. A triumph is making peace. Because if you just stop fighting, it is not permanent, it's not assuring. So, people said, well, with the Arabs, we cannot make peace. They want to overpower us, to destroy us. And there is no chance. I didn't share this idea, as I don't share it today. And just to see things as they happened, contrary to the seven walls, we have two peace agreements with Arabs. Right with the largest Arab country, Egypt, that holds on to this early day. It went through many difficult tests in the relations. But when you have peace, you don't have terror. And the same goes with the Jordanians. People used to say, Jordan is weak, they will never make peace with you. They did. And now, when I look at this situation today, people say again, you cannot make peace with the Arabs. Well, still, I don't agree with this view. Because for the first half of our history, the Arab had a policy, which is called the policy of Khartoum. Namely, there were three points in that policy. Never to recognize Israel never to negotiate with Israel, never to make peace with Israel. But nowadays, the Arabs proposed peace proposals. The Saudis proposed a peace document. We cannot, and I shouldn't agree with every article in it, but basically, it calls for peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Arab League, also proposed a peace process. It's a major change. But it's not that just a change in the announcement of policy, it's a change in the reality of things. Absolutely, yeah. At war, you fight until you win. But when you have terror, terror is not an army. And terror is not an extension of policies by other means. Terror is made of small groups, maybe a hundred or maybe a thousand, each of them with its own idea. None of them is coordinated. And 15 terrorists can come to New York and kill three or four thousand Americans or come to Russia and kill four hundred children. And the Arabs discovered that their real enemy is not necessarily the trade state, but their own terrorist organizations. They destroy the fabric of Arab life. They destroy the Lebanon. They destroy Syria. They destroy Iraq. They destroy the Yemen. They destroy Libya. And all of a sudden, they discovered that finally we are at the same front, namely against letting the terror up, the terrorist to terrorize our life. But we have all of us to make a joint effort, both political and military, militarily, to stop it. Right. To stop cutting heads. Right. And they call for cutting heads in the name of the Lord in heaven. <coughs> so we called now upon the religious leader of the world and say, gentlemen, how come they use the name of heaven 
and you are silent. Now we have a great religious leader, the Pope, the newly elected Pope. By the way, we are fighting against anti-Semitism. This is the first Pope who is really a friend of Israel, mm -hmm. who really fights terrorism, fights anti-Semitism. He's a good friend of ours. And we try to raise a voice instead of keeping a silence when they use the name of the Lord to justify murder. And I think we have to bring them in. The religious leaders as well. Absolutely. Our faith. I'm going to skip the rest of the leaders. I'm going to ask the last question. I've been told we're enjoying you so much. I'm going to ask you one question because this, I know that this group cares deeply about this last question. And this is what we as a community come together to make sure the future generations love Israel as much as we do. You were in your early 20s in 1948 when Israel was established and you had an unconditional love for Israel. I have a 20 year old. She's a political science uh, student, loves Israel, but also cares about social justice. How do I make sure, what would you tell her so she doesn't get disillusioned with Israel in a world today where the young generation have all these other things they care about under the umbrella of social justice? How do we help them not lose their connection and not get disillusioned with Israel? Today, the first call for the Jewish people is to keep their children Jewish. That's the first thing you have to do. And then also explain to them what does it mean Jewishness. It's not a sort of government, it's not a sort of admiration, it's not a sort of a church even. Because Jewishness is a faith, not an order. And every Jew can connect directly with the Lord in heaven. And I think what unites us, whether you're Jewish people who live in the States or live in Israel, all of us, is to do three things. Number one is to respect the Ten Commandments. That was the first revolution against violence against powerful kings, against corruption. The Ten Commandments contain only 172 words, that's all. It's 3,500 years old. No word was changed, or was necessary to change over those years, and it became, in a way, the foundation of the Western civilization. Yeah, civilization right. So we have to keep it. Because the meaning of Jewishness, in my eyes, is to give the moral call, the superior consideration. And that will keep them connected with Israel as well? Yes, I mean, we are maybe in different places, but we come from the same philosophy of Moses against uh, oppressors against uh, superior people. I mean, Moses was really the first Democrat, if you want. When, That's a good way to put it. Yeah. When he said that every person was born in the image of the Lord, this is the first call for equality. Not only you, but also strangers or other people. And he called for tikkun olam. You know, when I think about the Jewish people, I'm sure that the real Jew can never be satisfied. If you are becoming satisfied, you, you are in danger of being non-Jewish. Losing your Jewishness. <laughs> why, why are we dissatisfied? Because we believe that we can improve the world. Our business is improvement, and that's good for all people. And the third point, keep your children study and learning and question. Don't be satisfied with the norm, lectures, or conclusions, or perceptions. And that's the reason maybe that the Jewish people have so many scientists. Because science begins with questions, not with answers. Right. And the Jews are very good in putting questions. That's absolutely right. And uh, I'm proud to be a Jew. 
Absolutely. And I, if I would have to make a choice, like in the early days, I would think that of all attractions in life, the moral call is the right one. There is nothing wiser in life than to be an honest man, honest lady, and keep your children like it. People may have some other attractions too, but if you want really to hold yourself in your own hands, make this choice, it's uh, better and more important than power or wealth or strength. It costs a lot, I mean, to be honest. Absolutely. And to be more. But it's worthwhile to pay the price. And is that the secret to your life? You have had such a wonderful... S I mean, I, they're going to kill me if I don't ask you. What is the secret to this amazing honogenarian life that you've led? Uh, I, it's the last uh, question. Yeah. They're, they're getting to think this. But tell us. Tell us about the secret of, of, you, uh, of your life. Know. The Hebrew language doesn't have actually, in fact, three times past, presence, and future. <laughs> presence is almost illegal in the Hebrew language because according to the philosophy of the language, everything has either happened or may happen. Nothing is happening. The only thing that has a presence is the Lord in heaven. Mm. In Hebrew, the word presence is Hove. Hove. And Jehovah mm. is the Lord. He is the only one who it's has present. a permanent presence. Presence. So, and the past is dead. You cannot change the past. Finish. And we used to say that all experts are experts for things that didn't happen. They did happen. Right. You don't have an expert for things that didn't. may happen. Right. So, the orientation is on the future. Future is a dream, not something tangible. And I think to spend your life dreaming is a great choice and a great reality. Fantastic. And uh, people ask me, how can you keep your young uh, spirit or concept? I have a very simple proposal. Count the achievements of your life and count the dreams of your mind. If the number of the dreams exceeds the numbers of achievements, you are young. I love that. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Perez. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. May you always be healthy. And with Thank you so much. We hope to see you very